Thank you, for, uh, Professor Bainbridge, for those remarks. Our next speaker is Professor Roberta Romano. Professor Romano is the Oscar M. Rubhausen Professor of Law at her alma mater, Yale Law School, where she has taught since 1984, uh, after three years of teaching at Stanford Law School. Prior to joining the faculty at Stanford, Professor Romano clerked for Judge John Newman on the Court of Appeals for the Second Circuit. She has published three books and some 60 articles, uh, and if I uh, uh, interpreted them correctly, almost all of them deal with uh, corporate law in one way, shape, or form. Uh, so to say that uh, Professor Romano has devoted her professional life to the study and writing of corporate law uh, over the last 25 years is, is no exaggeration. We look forward to uh, Professor Romano's remarks. Thank you. So my task is to remind us of the um, benefits of, of regulatory competition or competitive federalism in the corporate and securities area. And I'm going to make uh, four points. Um, and I'm also, if I have time in these opening remarks, um, say that I, I think it's it's not correct to think of the federal government in Delaware as competing um, in some sense. They're just going to say, we're going to say what we think is in the federal domain compared to the states. Because when we think of competition, as I'll talk about the kinds of benefits from it, that's not what we um, think is going on when the, gov the federal government is um, involved in this. Um, and so the three points um, that we want to make about the benefits of competition are that are usually thought to be benefits of competition, in particular in the charter areas, improved incentives for the promoters or the, of, of corporations or the issuers, improved incentives for the regulators, um, state legislators, Legislators, um, agencies, um, and the like, and then innovation and experimentation. Experimentation, and then my fourth um, point will be sort of thinking about what the consequences are. The sort of the, what state law looks like, corporate law compared to the federal analog of securities regulation. So first, improved incentives for promoters, um, and Steve touched on this in his remarks. Um, so the um, idea we think here is that um, you, a promoter, someone who's selling stock in their company, can reduce the cost of capital if they choose a regime that the investors prefer. Now, investors set the price here because uh, capital, financial capital, is highly mobile. Right? Um, financial markets are, are quite competitive. Um, the opportunity set is large. I don't have to buy a stock in company A. I can buy stock in company B. I don't have to buy stock. I can buy bonds. I can buy, invest in currencies. I can invest in real estate. Um, I don't have to buy a stock in a US company. Um, I can buy um, it in somewhere else. So, um, and if we think about derivative securities to duplicate these um, cash flows, um, the opportunity set is infinite. So they're um, in a stronger bargaining position when we think of the forms of capital or what uh, promoters have to raise. Um, and so they're going to bear the cost of poor regime selection. Now this assumes that we have informed investors. Um, if we look at um, the current uh, nature of the stock market, uh, the vast majority of shares, more than 60%, are held by institutional investors. Um, and um, since most companies, uh, institutional investors and individual investors' shares are, are not distinguishable, what uh, benefits the institutional investors in their pro rata share will also equally be felt by the um, uninformed if we think individuals are uninformed. So the idea here is that if there are multiple regimes to choose from, the promoter whose um, goal we would think is to at least get the full value for the shares that um, he or she is selling is going to choose one that the investors will prefer, prefer that they think they'll do better under. What about the incentives of the regulators, um, that is the, the legislature, um, or at the federal level, the um, agency, the SEC, um, for setting the rules um, that these promoters um, are going to operate under, the firms will operate under. And the argument here is that if we have more than one regulator, um, that gives uh, an improved incentive on the regulator to choose uh, uh, rules that its regulated entities will benefit from, um, because it's a feedback mechanism, the ebb and flow or the inflows and the outflows of the, the regulated entities. So as Steve was mentioning, um, if I'm in California and I don't like California law, I don't think it's going to improve my uh, firm's uh, operating value or the cash I'll get from investors will be lower. I don't incorporate in California, I go somewhere else. The California regulator can see, if they see lots of firms leaving, they might look to see, well, what are the rules in the other jurisdiction that are preferable? Um, and that gives them some feedback about what they're doing. So um, 
Um, we can think of this in economics in terms of refill preferences, right? You can buy apples or oranges or what whatever combination you do. So the one you choose, given that they're all within your opportunity set of financial, is showing which one you prefer. And we can think of that analogously sort of in this uh, competitive uh, corporate structure that the firm that gets more of these, uh, the state, I'm sorry, that gets more of these firms um, is showing that their um, regime is more desired by investors. I should say it's more desired by promoters, but as I've mentioned, the incentives of promoters mean that they're going to be looking at the incentives of investors when they choose that regime, or it will come at a cost to them. They will either not sell as many shares or sell them at a far lower price, so their cost of capital will be higher. Um, and the motivation, though, for thinking about this, about, about why then we might think uh, it's good to have regulators be affected by the inflow and outflow of the um, regulated entities, is we think that the government is unlikely to know better than sophisticated uh, investors about what regulation is in their interest. And this is especially so because the requirements of business uh, are change over time. It's quite a dynamic setting, anyone operating in a business environment. Um, so requirements of what's good shift to, uh, will change frequently as the market conditions shift. Um, and competing regulators, um, one thinks, will make fewer policy mistakes than a monopoly regulator um, because uh, competition is harnessing the incentives of the markets to the regulatory process. So it's a self-correcting mechanism uh, from the firm's decisions, which uh, is referred to as regulatory arbitrage. Now, um, I guess in the, the previous, I was, I was able to catch a little of the financial regu uh, institution regulation setting, and there, regulatory arbitrage was seen as a pejorative term. So this is sort of the race to the bottom, I guess, phrase that Steve mentioned. Um, and it's not necessarily pejorative. If we think about innovation and experimentation, some of that comes from regulatory arbitrage. So the fact that one agency regulates securities and one it, it regulates derivatives, so we can say, well, I'm going to have something that duplicates cash flows of securities, and I don't have to be regulated by the SEC because I'm going to do it as a future or a forward contract and be under the CFTC, that doesn't necessarily mean that it's a bad thing. In fact, that means that we have more innovation in products when we have that kind of choice. Right? Um, and uh, there's examples of this, um, of innovations. Um, the financial derivatives is one of them. Um, but institutional practices, if you look at sort of margins, how margins are calculated uh, for um, uh, financial derivatives, such as options compared to futures, well, in the SEC setting where there was no competition, there was one clearing exchange for options, and it set margin rates. Um, no competition in the futures markets of the CFTC. Every particular exchange had its own clearing setup. Uh, so <clears throat> the Chicago um, Board of Exchange was different from <clears throat> the Mercantile Exchange. And it uh, turns out there was a study looking at the level of margins that were held that was efficient for brokers and the like. And when you had these competing ones, they actually had a, a more effective setting of the margins then in the options change. In fact, uh, at one point, the options exchange started looking at what these futures exchanges were doing. So regulatory arbitrage and competition um, can help in terms of experimentation and innovation. Um, and, um, and we find out what the preferred rules are. Corporate law example was um, in response, of, if we go back to the mid-1980s um, and the situation where um, uh, the directors and officers liability insurance had dried up. Um, there were issues at state law worried about, well, will we get outside directors on boards given we can't get insurance and the like. And the states then sort of were trying to deal with how should we um, approach this. Um, and the first state to act was Indiana, um, and it adopted a, a lower level of negligence uh, uh, standard. Gross negligence would be the standard for a duty of care breach. Um, Delaware um, acted later. Now, the ALI had come out with a proposal to cap damages uh, uh, at some ratio between, uh, um, I guess you could say, like the salary of the individuals um, and um, the liability. And Virginia passed a statute like that, um, although it was after Delaware had acted. Delaware adopted the, the 102B7 that we all know about, the limited liability provision, that allowed uh, firms' uh, shareholders to amend the charters to adapt whatever they wanted, eliminate it or cap it like the ALI. ALI. I mean, then we saw what did other states do? And a few copied Indiana, the vast majority ended up following the Delaware <laughs> statute. So there was some experimentation. Delaware saw what Indiana did first. It doesn't always move first, although it's usually a pioneer. But you have a diffusion then across the states uh, from learning from experience, which you can't get um, from uh, a non-competitive setting. Um, and uh, you know, sometimes there's a concern about, well, uh, we need standardization um, in a commercial law setting. And if we have multiple regulators, we might not get that. Um, but if we look at actually across the state laws, there's a great deal of uniformity. 
um, if diversity is desirable, um, that sort of will show, but we also sort of find if there are certain uh, provisions, such as having boards of directors, we're going to find it everywhere. Just sort of been thinking of the market. Do we need the government to say beta versus VHS? Eventually, there was standardization um, in, the, uh, in the, that setting without a government choosing it. Um, so, um, um, and that leads me to sort of the issue of sort of the consequences of competition. If we look at the content of, of corporate law, uh, this is sort of, you know, for everyone here who knows about this, is I'm just repeating what everyone knows, these statutes are basically enabling in structure. Um, and they don't have as many uh, mandatory provisions, so it means that you can customize it to the firm's needs. We've got a default, um, and then we can um, uh, change that. Um, the securities laws, so the federal component, and all of the proposals that Steve mentioned um, have a mandatory component. So you cannot sort of opt out. Now the SEC's rule on, uh, proposed rule on proxy access has something unusual for them. They're gonna have, they, are, we, well we don't know what it's gonna look like in the end, but there's sort of a one directional opting, optionality that they've got a mandate that's gonna be a minimum standard and you could opt out to make it even easier for shareholders to uh, gain access but not to make it more restrictive. But in general, they don't actually have any optional qualities to their regulations, their mandates.